A very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, doctors everywhere, and particularly our young students. Um, and this is the International Sleep Charities Global Webinar Series, and we've got something very different and really interesting for you today. I'm Charlie Alton, one of the co-founders, and um, we've got with us, um, whilst I'm in Winchester, UK, stateside with us is uh, Mr. Pat Connolly. Now, uh, he's co-founder of the world's very first um, venture capitalist specializing in the sleep industry. And he's a great guy to head it up because his um, experience is unequaled. Um, 37 years with William Sonoma. And not just that, is he joined it when the company was very small and he was right at the center of things, growing in Sonoma to be one of the largest, best rest um, respected and important brands in the US. So he's got really good firsthand experience of how you spot and more importantly, develop an opportunity. So he's going to give us an enthusiastic and well-argued case about the next big thing and how you can be involved in it. And um, at the end of his talk, there will be a question and answer session hosted by our um, Dr. PJ Wang. So if you've got any questions, please save them up until the end. And um, without any more ado, really, um, I'm going to hand over to the main event and say, Pat, thank you so much for joining us and really interested in what you have to say. Thank you. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you. Uh Thank you very much, Charlie. I'm just, um, I'm really pleased um, uh, to be here today. And uh, I want to begin by thanking the International Sleep Charity uh, for giving me this opportunity to, to, uh, to present to you. Uh, I am, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, I know that many of you who are um, uh, listening in on this global webinar series today are already interested in sleep, but I also know that there's many of you who are students and hopefully uh, my thoughts will, will resonate with you as well. Uh, one of the things um, that uh, you have the advantage of when you're, when you're 75 years old is that uh, you've had a chance to see the early beginnings of what would later become a major trend. And in, in 1978, which is quite a while ago, I attended the CES show in Las Vegas. As CES stands for the Consumer Electronics Show. It's a massive trade show that now draws about 200,000 people over a one week period. So I'm walking around the show and I wander into a booth where two young 20 somethings are showing off what they call a home computer. People are coming into the booth and asking, what's that? And these guys, these two guys are saying, well, it's a home computer. And the most common response they got was, why would anyone need that? Well, the two guys in the booth were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, Wozniak and they were introducing the Apple computer too. And I think in the 43 years since that day, that Apple has answered the question of what you would do with that, as they are now the second most valuable company in the world. About two years earlier, I was at the National Sporting Goods Show and was invited to a private presentation by the head sporting goods company. They had become well known for their line of skis and tennis rackets. They were introducing a line of fitness apparel, what to wear while you're exercising. Back in the early 70s, you put on an old shirt and a pair of gym shorts. That's what you did. There wasn't a broad range of uh, fitness apparel available. Um, they had done tremendous research right down to the trim colors that were based on the four most popular colors of high school football uniforms. During the break, I asked one of the executives, said, you must think this fitness trend is really going to take off. And he said, we don't know if it will or not, but we do know one thing. Americans always buy the equipment first. I've never forgotten that. <laughs> I think that's been so true about so many things in terms of uh, trends in the U.S. Back in 1978, I don't think that even Steve Jobs dreamed that Apple would be where it is today and that the executives of Head never dreamed how big the fitness trend in the fitness industry would become. 
from shoes to apparel to personal training, Peloton, fitness clubs. It's become a major industry. So what is the next big thing? I just mentioned what the trends I just mentioned weren't so obvious at first. You had to think about what would change that could actually, what, were, what would be the factors that would actually propel their growth to become a major trend. In 1974, the US government filed an antitrust case against AT&T, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. AT&T controlled virtually every aspect of the telecommunications industry in the US and Canada, everything right down to all the equipment that was in your home. In the early 80s, the company was finally broken up into a series of regional companies. And in the process, the courts gave AT&T several options, several choices that they could make as to what they could retain. One of them was that they could, re they could keep the cellular spectrum. At that time, they owned the entire cell phone spectrum in the U.S. Or they could keep their telephone directory business, which was called the Yellow Pages. To the executives at AT&T, the decision was a no-brainer. They saw no future in the cellular business. Cell phones were so large that they were confined to automobiles because the hardware was so big and it took up most of the trunk. On the other hand, the yellow pages were the most profitable part of their business. So obviously, they took the yellow pages. I know someone who was part of that decision, and he said, we never thought what if these phones, through technology development, get smaller? In their, even in their discussions, I think he said someone brought up, what if they got smaller? And the answer was, well, even if they did, who would want to carry one around and have people call them? No one would want that. This is a true story. You can't make stuff like this up. It really happened. They took the yellow pages. But every once in a generation, there's a trend that I would call is hiding in plain sight. And then almost all of a sudden, over a short period of years, it gets people's attention. I believe that trend is sleep improvement and it's going to be the next big thing. Why? Because people are starting to realize that sleep is important. It has an impact on almost every aspect of your life, your health, your well-being, your work, your athletic performance, you name it. Those of you viewing this global ser webinar series today, many of you know that. But now, only now, are most people beginning to realize it. Up until about six years ago, I thought that sleep was a nuisance. I would say you can sleep when you're dead. When I was in college and early, early in my career, if you weren't pulling all-nighters regularly, you were considered weak. That has certainly changed for me and is starting to change for so many others. The popular media have picked up on sleep. It has become the topic of so many TED Talks and best-selling books like Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, which have all educated people that sleep is important. In fact, Matt would argue that sleep is more important to your long-term health and well-being and wellness than either diet or exercise. What changed for me was meeting the executives at ResMed, the world leader in the treatment of chronic sleep disorders like sleep apnea. They asked me to join the board of Sleep Score Labs, a joint venture that they had funded, which I did. What I learned since then about the impact of sleep and that it has on virtually every aspect of our lives has convinced me that indeed, sleep is the next big thing. Virtually all chronic diseases are associated with poor sleep, virtually all. Now there's been discussion of course, as to which causes which. Does chronic disease cause poor sleep or does poor sleep cause chronic disease? But there's a mounting body of evidence that would say that poor sleep has an impact on, at least on severity of these diseases, which now con chronic diseases are basically lifestyle diseases as a result of our poor habits obesity, lung disease, heart disease, they're all chronic diseases and they cause, they are responsible for 80% of our healthcare burden. But why now? Why is the sleep opportunity now? 
In other words, what are the factors that will propel it to become a major trend, like in fitness or nutrition or the personal computer industry? In the case of sleep, there are so many factors that have sort of come together in a very short period of time to create this opportunity. First of all, sleep science is a young but quickly emerging field. Public awareness of the importance of sleep is rising quickly. Google shopping searches for sleep improvement products are now significantly greater than the same searches for fitness and nutrition products. Technology advancements in biometric sensing are enabling greater insights into sleep. The pandemic has only heightened the importance of sleep. COVID, related, COVID has created increased prevalence of mental health issues, anxiety, and insomnia. And wearables have expand, exploded into the market, and many of them have sleep tracking apps of varying accuracy embedded in them. Wearables have made it easy for us to track various aspects of our health and sleep and take more control over it. Each new release of the Apple Watch, for example, has more features to measure our health. The most recent, I think it's Apple 6, Apple Watch 6, has the ability to measure oxygen saturation, for example. This is important, what Apple is doing, because Apple is now the number one watch brand in the world, surpassing what was previously number one, Rolex. Almost every major professional team has a sleep advisor or sleep coach. Athletes have come to recognize that their performance can be significantly impacted by the quality of their sleep. And the sports media have picked up on this and they're talking about it, which has encouraged amateur athletes to become more focused on their sleep. And I believe that if the world's population achieved a level of healthy sleep, it would have the greatest impact on our health and well being and dramatically reduce the ever growing healthcare cost burden that we're currently experiencing. This presents an incredible opportunity for those who pursue a career in a sleep-related field. It also presents an incredible opportunity for investing in which is what we have pursued. As a result, I believe it so strongly that I founded a venture fund, the first in the world that is focused exclusively on investing in companies whose products and services improve sleep. I was able to recruit two outstanding individuals to join me and we've launched Supermoon Capital. We call this opportunity the night market, a term we've actually trademarked. So as the night market presents an incredible opportunity in investments, so it presents great career opportunities. Here's why. One of the key questions in any startup is what is the total addressable market, what is called the TAM? How many people actually need or want your product or service? The bigger the TAM, well, the bigger the opportunity. So let's look at sleep. Well, there's 7.7 .7 billion people in the world they all sleep. And about 45% of them wake up every morning not having slept well the night before. That's a big number. 20% of the US population suffers from insomnia, and there's almost a billion people worldwide that have some degree of sleep apnea, with 85% of that undiagnosed. But there are a lot of people who didn't sleep well who don't even know it. They think that's normal. So the number is probably bigger. I look at it another way. Ask anyone if they wish they, would, they slept better. Who doesn't? I believe even that those who are not sleeping poorly will want to sleep even better. This will happen as the popu population realizes that good sleep improves their appearance, their performance at work, helps them lose weight and improve their fitness. So basically, the market is everyone. Why is this? Why is everyone sleeping poorly? How did this happen? Well, I think my partner Grayson put it best. Almost all investment to date has been to extend and enhance our day. From the electric light bulb 
to the blue light that's emitted from our televisions, our personal computers and phones, which have created an almost always on society, the emergence of social media. But this extension of our day has come at the expense of our night. We with our investments and you with your careers can help, help have the opportunity to turn this around. Those of you who are studying the science of sleep or related fields that impact sleep are in the right place at the right time. The average person is beginning to realize the negative effects of sleep deprivation. And at the same time, technologies are emerging that are allowing scientists and consumer to measure their sleep and understand its impact on their behavior. You couldn't be at a better place at a better time. I think that the sleep improvement economy, which is at just beginning, has interesting parallels to the early stages of the fitness and nutrition trends. There was a lot of what we would call snake oil in the early stages of the fitness trend. These are some of the advertisements that people saw early in this trend. Fat jiggling machines, wonder sauna hot pants, even a shoe company as little as fifth, as late as 15 years ago advertised a shoe that they said if you bought it, you would lose weight. Now the government made them made all of these claims be taken down. I mean, they and at the same sort of thing occurred in the nutrition, the nutrition craze. The Lucky Strike cigarette company actually advertised to young women telling them if they smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes, they would lose weight. The Baby Ruth Candy Bar Company claimed that the nutritional value of a Baby Ruth Candy Bar was equal to that of an apple. So there was a lot of, of snake oil in these. Even it, And we're seeing the same thing with sleep. We're early in this game. Fitbit, one of the wearables manufacturers, was sued by the federal government for false claims about the accuracy of their app in tracking sleep. There's a popular uh, nighttime advertisement called My Pillow in the U.S., and the, it claimed that you're just buying the pillow would dramatic. There were lots of claims that it made about related to sleep, which were proven untrue, and they were stopped. There's so there's a lot that's the same that we saw in fitness and nutrition that we're now seeing in sleep. But like in fitness, where, where early claims were ineffective and harmful, those categories have shown to respond to really um, create new products, which were uh, uh, effective and which have thrived. And I think the same thing will happen uh, with respect to sleep. But all of this hypermarketing has drawn even greater attention to sleep. If you search Amazon for sleep, you get over 100,000 products, books, potions, pills, different products, you name it. So if 75% of Americans have Amazon Prime in their home, and there's over 100,000 solutions available, why isn't everyone sleeping better? Well, it's because many of the so-called sleep improvement products don't live up to their claims or don't address a person's particularly, particular sleep issue. The determinants of sleep health are wide ranging and very complex. At the same time, that opens the door to a range of interventions and product categories and solution mediums that are ripe for disruption. This is where you come in as a student of sleep. What the world needs are scientifically validated products and solutions that match the solutions to the issue. Therefore, we need more sleep scientists, researchers, and therapists, engineers and marketers and the like that are educated in sleep. They need you and many more like you. We actively track over 800 early stage companies that are engaged in some form of sleep improvement. Virtually every one of them has job postings for sleep professionals. That's why the time is now. 
Over the course of your working life, your career is likely to take a number of turns and different paths. It did so for me and many of my friends. I was educated as a mechanical engineer and I practiced as an industrial engineer, but ended up in the direct response business, first in catalog marketing and then of course in e-commerce. I had an incredible career that spanned over 37 years at the same company. I got to work with some very talented people and help build a very successful company with some of the most coveted brands in retail. It was a career that was professionally and emotionally and financially rewarding. Two years before I retired, I was exposed to sleep. I retired, but I couldn't get this sleep thing out of my mind. I had seen firsthand the development of the personal computer industry, the fitness trend, and the nutrition trend. I saw so many similarities between these trends and what I see as the trend improvement and the resulting night market. I'm so passionate about the sleep opportunity that I've embarked on my second career. And I believe that it will be as emotionally and financially and professionally rewarding as my first. I've attracted two great partners and we founded Supermoon Capital. And it's the first fund in the world focused exclusively on sleep. I am confident that we will reward our investors with great returns and in the process, help a billion people improve their long-term health and well-being through better sleep. So how can we possibly improve the lives of a billion people? Well, you do it a few million at a time. Let me give you some examples. One of our first investments was in Sleep Score Labs. It's a sleep science company, and I was on the board. I still am. Sleep Score Forge has forged a partnership with Mattress Firm, which is the largest retailer of mattresses in the world. And they sell over 25% of all the mattresses in the United States. Beginning this month, Mattress Firm will offer a special Sleep Score app, a sleep improvement app, to all 8 million of their annual customers. Sleep Score is also working with one of the largest health insurance providers in the U.S., to offer a sleep improvement program, not only to the health insurance employees, but to the companies they insure. That's tens of billions, tens of millions. These are just two examples. You do it a few million at a time. And these are the kinds of opportunities that get me up in the morning. But what about you? What should you do? What will get you up in the morning? If I were you, I would pursue an opportunity in sleep. First of all, you want to be in early in an area that is going to experience hyper growth because it will create opportunities with greater responsibility and greater rewards for you. Those who are in early will reap much greater rewards than those who join later. I'm sure that the last hundred engineers that Google has hired will have a great career opportunity but nothing like the first 100 engineers that Google hired. My favorite example is that of Ryan Graves. Who is Ryan Graves? He was the first employee at Uber. Travis Kalanick, the founder of Uber, sent out a tweet and said, I'm looking for a great product manager, biz dev guy, any tips? Ryan, who was a database administrator engineer at a Bay Area firm, tweeted back, I've got a tip for you. Send me your email. Travis thought that was pretty good. They started communicating. Ryan went to work. He worked directly with Travis, ended up running large areas of the business that they, as they grew. And when they, the day they went public, Ryan was worth $1.7 billion. Now, not everyone who joins a very early stage company is going to be worth 1.7 billion. But if you don't take the risk, you will never have an opportunity. Sleep is an opportunity to be in early. The second thing I would do is pursue a discipline that you are good at. If you ask people, what should I do? They will say, follow your passion. 
those people have already been successful. They can afford to follow their passion. My advice to you is do something you're good at. Then choose your boss carefully. Try to go to work for someone who you feel will be very successful. Because as they were, are successful, they will take you with them. How do you make sure that they take you with you, that they take you with them as they grow in their careers? You work hard. I would take the advice of Sacha Nadella, of Sacha Nadella's parents, and what they constantly told Sacha and his siblings as they were growing up in India. That advice was to do work that is so outstanding, it cannot be ignored. Do work that is so outstanding, it cannot be ignored. Sacha took that advice when he joined Microsoft. And after 23 years, he got his chance to be CEO. And now under his leadership, Microsoft has overtaken Apple to become the most valuable company in the world. So pursue a discipline that you're good at and then apply it to some area of sleep, what we have called the night market. Find a person who is a great person to work for and do work that is so outstanding it cannot be ignored. And if you do, you will achieve a level of professional and financial success that sitting here today, you can't even imagine. The night market is the opportunity of a lifetime. Get involved in it. Thank you very much for allowing me to share some thoughts with you. I think we have some time for questions. And so if you have questions, I'd be very pleased to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much for a fascinating, deep hearted conversation on the history of sleep and the opportunities that we can take to the night market. It was certainly enlightening. Now we can take a few questions if people would like to, to send a few questions. Uh, we have uh, a few other questions, at least from my end, that I'd be quite interested to, to know. So from, from uh, my end, I have a bit of a clinical background. I have a bit of a research background, but less so in the VC, less so in the commercial space. And I'm wondering what advice would you give for individuals at three particular stages to get the interest of superman capital and, and people like yourself? Say people who have an idea, people who have a product and people who have a company at those particular stages, what advice would you give them? I think, um, well, I think there's, I think there's two questions there is one, how do you get more involved? Mm. Right. That one of them. Absolutely. And then how do you, how do you put them forward? And I think we at Supermoon <laughs> Capital actually uh, have uh, the same desires and that is to attract the attention of researchers like yourself. Mm. Uh, we're developing a network of experts around the world in various categories who we can correspond with and who can correspond with each other. We're in the early stages of that. We have a sleep science collective right now, mm -hmm. which is of the world's leading sleep scientists. We, ex we want to expand that to, into a much greater network and reach out to people around the world in, in fields like yourself and what you're doing at the, at the academic and research uh, to, to join us in that effort. And in a way also for you to be able to uh, have dialogues with others around the world who have the same interests. So that's the first thing. Sure. And then that what we hope to do is to be able to uh, provide opportunities for people like yourself to serve as advisors and experts to some of our portfolio companies, where there is a correlation between your interests and background and the needs of that particular company. And that provides an opportunity uh, for you to not only have greater professional growth, but usually those opportunities come with an equity interest in the, in the, in the startup. And uh, that's a great way for you to participate in this economy in a very, in the night market, in a very beneficial, not only professionally satisfying way, but also, um, uh, uh, also in a, in a, as financial returns. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important because what the world needs is validated solutions. 
And as you know, it's a very sleep is very complex. And so mm-hmm. your your knowledge and your expertise can help a company you're associated with to validate the specific areas where their product can help people. And that's what's going to advance the whole night market. So, okay. That's a very enlightening. Yeah, enlightening route. And certainly uh, your your talk has been um, eye-opening in terms of the opportunities that we can take, and especially for our younger researchers and our younger uh, students, if they have an interest in sleep, how they can pursue that. Uh, we do have some questions on our Q&A. Um, we have a particular question about what opportunities does the night market offer to people outside the United States, uh, specifically Asia, and I would presume China, the big market, the, the burgeoning uh, middle class there. Well, I think I think they're enormous. Um, we have uh, in our first six investments, uh, one is based in Amsterdam, one in Berlin, one in Tel Aviv, uh, one in Southern California, and one in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so we are um, we are looking at opportunities around the world. Um, uh, poor sleep is not uh, confined just to <laughs> just to the Europe and the and the, and the EU and 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 the UK and the United States. It's everywhere. Uh, I think, especially in in Asian countries, uh, that there's who actually had night markets. Uh, uh, I think there's a, a really a big opportunity there. We have mm-hmm. not uh, to date invested in a company in in Asia, but we certainly intend to. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think the opportunities there are going to be very significant. And I would encourage people who have ideas to reach out to us. Okay. We so, want to see all the ideas. And mm. uh, sometimes they may be at, at a little more advanced stage. We tend to like to be in early. And one of the things that we do in our fund, which uh, our, our portfolio companies very much appreciate, is we like to add what we call post-investment value creation. We like to help them in ways, introductions to particular, to potential customers, uh, knowledge of uh, regulatory affairs, whatever. So we have experts that can help companies uh, leverage their unique uh, competence in in a in faster in a commercial way. Certainly, oh, thank you very much, Pat. And I think that answers a <coughs> um, our idea for our Indian and Chinese viewers that reach out to Supermoon and they will. Be able to help reach out to us you out. <laughs> <laughs> right and a another question thank you very much from mabel um what are some particular sleep disorders that need more attention and innovation than others is there anything that really perks the mind as something to particularly target well i think you know there are the um the, the, certainly sleep apnea is one that has gotten mm. a lot of attention. There's a lot of focus on sleep apnea because mm. um, people are, it, first of all, it's, it's debilitating if you don't treat it. And, um, and, the, and, and diagnosis is difficult. Um, the, the use of uh, sleep labs is it's very hard, at least in the United States. It takes a long time to get an appointment. It's not a very pleasant experience. There's a lot of investment has gone into home sleep tests, mm. for example. So that's an example. Um, there's focus on on insomnia. I think that's a big opportunity. Uh, I think 20% of the U.S. population has some form of it, and there, uh, I think that you know the, uh, the the ideal solution hasn't been hasn't really been developed yet. There's a, a practice called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia (CBTI), but it's it's really hard for people to follow it. Um, and so how, how do you, uh, can you, can you develop a program where you can intervene to keep people on it? Uh, it works, but people tend to drop off because they, uh, it's difficult to stay with the program. So there's an opportunity, I think, for the person who, the company that comes up with a, with a process that Mm -hmm. the right interventions to motivate people to keep on it, that can be, uh, that could be very helpful. So those are two. Um, there are, I think, like 130 different sleep disorders, uh, from restless leg syndrome to insomnia to narcolepsy. There's, there's an awful lot uh, out there, and uh, each of them has a very big market potential. Absolutely, absolutely. 
back here on that, Pat. Um, from my side, I will say that uh, from the research and the clinical side, it's not just the commercial side where sleep is becoming very much a big deal and, and put towards the fore, that people are realizing that sleep is a fundamental process of our mind, that it's critical to our development of sleep. Um, as one of our professors would say, is the price of neuroplasticity. It's the time where the brain clears out the gutters, clears out its highways, and forms some memories and builds things. So you know, it's something which is uh, very critical. And you, you see huge rates of Alzheimer's progression um, and okay. dementias and huge um, neurological disorder rates uh, in people who have night shifts and people who have disturbed sleep. So it's definitely a, well, a fuel to, to crack on. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that I think, that, you know, the the preventing the early onset of dementia and Alzheimer's is, is critical. It's been, it's been linked to sleep. You know, as you know, the research is increasingly mm -hmm. linking into it. And, and it's, it's uh, like my partner Grayson said, you know, our, our night has been a victim of our extended day, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. starting with the light bulb. Right. <laughs> <That was laughs> and, and just going from there. So we can always be on and, and I think I, I do think that people are really starting to understand that. And COVID, there have not been many med benefits of COVID, but one of them is that people have really started to understand how important sleep is to their health. There's some research that's come out, for example, that says that if you have poor sleep the week before you get a vaccine, any vaccine, not just the COVID vaccine, that it can reduce its effectiveness mm -hmm. by up to 50%. So when we think about people who've been vaccinated and still get COVID, it could be because they weren't getting good sleep before. So it's just everywhere you turn, sleep is, is uh, important on the worker safety side. Some of the biggest accidents in commercial history have been caused by poor sleep, like the Exxon Valdez oil spill and others that, um, where it was uh, someone who didn't have adequate sleep and made the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more um, traffic accidents and there's as many traffic fatalities caused by drowsy sleep as by drunk drivers mm -hmm. in the U.S. So there's, you know, just every, everywhere you turn, you see that. And uh, in, in the U.S., there, there's, a, there's an initiative to try and change the start times for public schools, for all schools, because the circadian rhythms of teenagers are very different than that of adults. And asking them to get up in class at, and go to class at 7, 7.30 in the morning is the equivalent of asking an adult to get up at 2 in the morning. And so, you know, everywhere we turn, we see that. In sports, a uh, huge impact of, uh, of, of sleep on sports performance. Uh, almost all the major teams have a sleep coach. And uh, one of our advisors uh, was the sleep coach for the uh, professional basketball team, the Golden State Warriors, and helped one of the players improve their overall performance by almost 30% just by improving their sleep. So now, you know, it, it's uh, some of the best athletes in the world are, are huge sleep uh, uh, advocates. perspective from a public health perspective um sleep it has the largest potential for change simply because everyone has to sleep everyone is looking for more sleep everyone is going to have some kind of sleep issue everyone would benefit from more and yeah i suppose from a commercial perspective it's not just a a billion people with diabetes it's not just a billion people with obesity there are seven billion people who will benefit from more sleep so I think that's very much something that's what I believe. I mean, I, I think that uh, that you know, if you look at if you look at the fitness trends, some of the people who are most focused on the products and services associated with the industry are actually people who are already good athletes, and so people who don't necessarily have a sleep disorder, but when they understand the benefits of healthy sleep, right down to improving your appearance, it improves the appearance of your skin. That's so true. beauty sleep is not just a term; it's actually it's right. And it's, it's the real thing. And people will really, you know, will, will start to do it. And, and you don't need any, you know, you don't need any special equipment to do it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a mindset change. And I think um, that's why the time is now, you know, it's just that all of these things have come together and, and people are, are no pun intended, waking up to the importance of sleep. 
absolutely. Now, Pat, we have two more questions on our Q&A. Um, we have a question currently about, uh, there are currently a lot of sleep monitoring devices, but do you see wearable devices that improve sleep increasing? Yes, in the, in, <laughs> in the short. I, I think um, there is, um, uh, they're getting better. Uh, the, 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 the issue, uh, almost, there's almost all the wearables have some sleep function, uh, from the Apple watch up to whoop and, and aura. Um, one of our portfolio companies, sleep score labs actually has probably the most accurate, uh, sleep monitoring device. It's the one I use. It's incredible. The hard, the hard thing in, in, in measuring sleep stages accurately is what they call wake sensitivity. The, the wearables tend to, because you're asleep 85% of the time you're in bed, if the algorithm has a question of whether you're awake or you're asleep, they tend to err on the side of saying you're asleep when you're actually you're not. And so they tend to under, under uh, report uh, wake, how much time you're awake, but they're getting better. And, uh, you know, the Apple Watch continues to add more features, and, and so do the others. Um, Whoop, which is a, a wearable, was now uh, used by uh, the PGA Professional Golf Association, and it was able to uh, predict uh, the onset of uh, COVID by looking at uh, certain behaviors and data. So I, I think wearables are, are, are going to continue to be... Um, uh, obviously more uh have more health features more health reporting features and and i think they're going to be um we will see uh people becoming more really more uh, understanding of the fact that they have to monitor their own health not everybody's going to do it but a lot of people are one of our portfolio companies called claire labs in tel aviv israel has developed a non-contact biometric measurement through computer vision. And uh, you can imagine five, 10 years from now, instead of having an alarm system in your house that's monitoring the activities of your house, to have a home health hub where just uh, through computer vision, it can report your, your, in your state of health. That's where we're gonna be. You're gonna have a home health hub and it will transmit information in the cloud of a, on an exception basis to your doctor who calls you and says, PJ, I think, you know, I'm worried about your blood pressure. I'm worried about your oxygen saturation level. You know, that's, that's going to be very helpful to people. So that's where it's going. Technology is really going to advance on a proactive basis, our ability to early diagnose diseases and early diagnose sleep disorders and prevent them from becoming uh, major health issues. Certainly. Um, I will say from my experience that um, people don't realize quite the sensitivity of the products that we have now, that uh, even with camera phones, they have some kind of ability to pick up atrial fibrillation and the, the Apple Watch, that ability to, to pick up these arrhythmias in the heart. That was more yes. an ethical decision uh, for Apple to give a medical diagnosis rather than any sort of technical um, drawback. It was more a medical legal decision on their part that were they confident enough to get the 99.99% um, accuracy for that. So okay. there is a lot of potential. Yes, hmm. and I think Apple, you know, obviously they have to go about it the right way. And they, but I think they will, I think what, what and I've had friends experience this where they've got a message that says, you know, this is something we detected in a regular heartbeat. We may suggest you might um, contact your doctor. And eventually that data will be available through Apple Health to your doctor and he can decide. Mm. And that's that's where we're going with that. Yes, certainly. You can see the, the networks connecting together and just having yes. in for the in internet of health, as it were. Um, we have another question uh, from one of our attendees uh, about what advice would you give to doctors seeking to specialize in sleep medicine and insomnia? And to thank you for an inspiring talk, Pat, as well. Well, thank you. I, I think that is a huge, um, a huge opportunity. You know, we do need more uh, sleep scientists and doctors who are, who are focusing on sleep. It is a, um, you know, sleep. Uh, the, the medical education for the average uh, 
medical education in the United States anyway, has a, a limited amount of time that is spent on sleep. And it's a little bit political because if that has, goes in, something else has to come out and no one wants to let out what they're already, what they've lobbied so hard to get into the curriculum. But I think that will change. And uh, there's, a, there's a crying need for more uh, sleep professionals uh, at, the, at the medical level. I mean, it, it's, it's probably the biggest opportunity. So I Telehealth help. will help. I think. I think that's one of the things that uh, that I have that we have seen in the United States, in particular, is that uh, telehealth is now reimbursable by most of the major payers. It's accepted in almost every state, and it's. Um, I think it's it's a uh, it's a medium where sleep professionals can leverage their expertise uh, to to deal with patients. And people with sleep disorders, um, in a, in, there, there's a lot of. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to do that, and that can that can help expand the field very quickly. Certainly, please do excuse me. And if I could give my a little bit of my token, very junior advice uh, to this uh, to this gentleman or lady who's having a bit of an interest in sleep uh, for medicine. Um, from my perspective, um, the the best way to to go about approaching sleep is to to keep an open mind and to realize that there are many pathways. My initial pathway was more a respiratory sciences path, dealing with apnea, dealing with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, up until I realized I had an interest in sleep, and then I looked for various research groups, looked for various uh, people uh, or re researchers or professors around my uh, institution who had an interest and basically sending a lot of cold emails, a very lot of sweet emails and trying to pop up to, to see people in, in, in person. And there is a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity to, to move forward regardless of whatever career path. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm taking more the neurological route um, these days rather than the respiratory route, but um, there are many roads to Rome, as it were, and you just need to be adaptable. That's what I found. <clears throat> right. Hey. Oh, another question. Um, yes, today's video will certainly be posted online. Uh, we'll be uploading it to YouTube and we will have a link uh, which we will send through some of the uh, social media. Uh, through LinkedIn and through some of our email chains as well. Right. Right. Just wondering, any anything else? Any any other pressing, burning questions in sleep that our audience has? And if there isn't anything else um, at all, then I would just like to thank Pat ever so much for sharing some of his uh, invaluable wisdom in the world of sleep. Um, in the world of VC, in the world of his innumerable experiences and his, his wisdom that he's shared with us. And I'd ask that you share his, his wisdom far and wide and take some of the principles that, yeah, it, it's best to be on the ground floor. And yeah, we, we have the potential to be there. So I, I will certainly be taking that to heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I would encourage everybody who was uh, able to listen to share it with your friends. And we would encourage you to share it far and wide. So yes. thank you ever so much. And we'd be delighted to have you back in the future and wishing you the best. Happy Thanksgiving next week as well. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.